All right, welcome to chapel. Would you please stand with us as we worship together through song?
calling on the Holy Spirit. Almighty River, come and fill me again. Come and fill me Father God, you are the God of these stories, the God of the Holy Word. These stories are true and real, and we praise you, God. You are the same God that did so many miracles in the Bible. You are the same God doing miracles now. Open our eyes to see the miracles, God, that you're doing. Open our hearts to hear your voice to follow what you ask us to do, O God. Thank you for this opportunity this morning to come and lift your name high, to praise you, to honor you, to listen to your word through Sarah Jo. And I pray for her this morning, God. Would you speak through her to touch our hearts, to lead us closer to you? For those that may not know you yet, I pray today they would surrender their life and their heart and follow you. Draw us together in your Holy Spirit. Change us. We give you honor and glory. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Good morning and welcome to chapel. I am glad that you're here today. Move these out of the way. Thank you. You may have noticed the the band looked a little different today. Um, Not any better or worse, just different. Uh, So I just thank the faculty and staff for their willingness to come and to lead us in worship today. That was awesome. So yeah, we can give them another round of applause. That was great. Uh, So um, over the break, hopefully you had a good break, hopefully you feel rested, rejuvenated, ready to go, finish the semester strong. You are on the downhill, okay, on the second half of the semester, and and so hopefully you have the energy and the uh, rejuvenation to be able to finish strong. Um, But over the break, I sent you a link to an opportunity to get an extra chapel credit by filling out a spiritual life survey. And hopefully you guys did that. Hopefully many of you did that. If you did, you're probably wondering, well, why didn't I get my chapel credit yet? Uh, Well, once the the whole survey is complete, they'll send me a list of everyone who's taken it, and then I'll enter you in. So I plan to let that go until this Friday. So if you haven't taken it yet and you'd like to still take that for an opportunity to make make an extra chapel credit, it is still open, and you can still do that through this week. I'll close it on Friday. And then you'll, I'll, be, I'll put those in either Friday or Monday. So if you haven't seen it, that's why. I think that's the only announcement I have for today. Um, yes. So today uh, we have our chapel speaker, comes from Kansas City area. Uh, Sarah Jo will graduate with her master's in arts and theology from Fuller Theological Seminary in June. And then she hopes to start her PhD program in the fall of 2023. Uh, Sarah Jo served as a full-time youth pastor here in Hillsboro for seven years at Hillsboro Mennonite Brethren Church, and now she works as a full-time substitute teacher in the elementary school. She lives, like I said, with her family in the Kansas City area, her husband Lee and her three children, Penelope, uh, Lydia, and Hezekiah. Would you please help me welcome Sarah Jo as she comes to share God's word today? Thank you, Ryan. Hey, guys. Good to be here with you. It's always Uh, wonderful to be uh, at Tabor here. Um, I was thinking as I came in, like, goodness, every year I get older and they all just keep staying young. So I was really glad to see that we we had the varsity team up here today to um, make me feel a little bit more in my age bracket. But you guys make me feel youthful. It's great to be on a college campus. Uh, I love seeing familiar faces, although there are less and less familiar faces each year. And I wish that I could sit and hear from you. Uh, So I recognize, like, here this stranger is coming in. What could she say to us? And I recognize that, like, that there's an imbalance here. 
and I would love to hear your stories. Uh, and so I humbly come before you to share, and I recognize that for anything meaningful to happen here today, it has to be the Holy Spirit. Uh, but I wish that I could listen to you and hear your stories. So thank you for the grace uh, that you extend to me to allow me to share with you uh, today. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna turn to Mark 10. Um, I'm going to dive right in because I want to respect your time here. Uh, in Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 46, and I'm going to read from uh, David Bentley Hart's translation of the New Testament. Um, don't worry, it's nothing like heretical or anything. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, you can follow along if you want, but we're going to begin in verse 46. It says, they came into Jericho. And as Jesus was departing from Jericho, along with his disciples and a considerable crowd, a blind beggar, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, sat beside the road. And hearing that it is Jesus the Nazarene, he began to cry out and to say, Son of David, Jesus, have mercy on me. And many persons admonished him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And coming to a standstill, Jesus said, call to him. And they called to the blind man, saying to him, take heart, arise, he calls to you. So throwing off his mantle and springing up, he came to Jesus. And answering him, Jesus said, what do you wish that I might do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabuni, that I may see again. And Jesus said to him, go. Your faith has healed you. And immediately he saw again and followed Jesus upon the road. When I read scripture, I want the story to come alive uh, for me. I want to envision it and use my imagination to really see it. So I want you to do that with me today. And as we consider the rest of the story, I want you to keep something in mind. Bartimaeus cannot physically see Jesus coming. But he's heard that Jesus the Nazarene is nearby. And Bartimaeus recognizes Jesus better than those traveling with Jesus. So as Jesus approaches this place where Bartimaeus is sitting on the roadside, Bartimaeus calls out to him with, with great expectancy. Son of David, Jesus, have mercy on me. But something happens in the story. Something happens that makes me feel really uncomfortable. And that is the crowd's response to Bartimaeus on the roadside. In the NRSV, it says that many people sternly ordered him to be quiet. So picture this scene with me. There's a big crowd of people coming down a dusty road, and there's a guy in the middle that everybody's trying to get closer to. They all want to be close to him. They all want to interact with him. They're going to go wherever he's going. So they're traveling with him from one place to another. And there's a lot of noisy bodies and people chatting and feet thumping along the road. And someone off to the side, not on the inside, someone out on the outside calls out, Jesus, have mercy on me. And the crowd's knee-jerk reaction is not to say, hey, Jesus, somebody's calling for you. Their knee-jerk reaction is to say, hey, you, be quiet. And I don't know why that is. Maybe they think uh, this man would be interrupting Jesus' schedule for the day, his agenda, his plan. Maybe they're like, we're trying to get somewhere, so please don't interrupt. Maybe they think that this guy is insignificant to Jesus' mission. He has more important things to do. Maybe they don't want Jesus to give this guy special attention because it might take away from the special attention that they could get from Jesus. I don't know. But good news, Bartimaeus is undeterred. Nothing is going to keep him from calling out with shameless and holy audacity. I mean, imagine how loud he would have to yell over this crowd. Son of David, have mercy on me. And something happens. I mean, something so shocking happens. Jesus stands still in the middle of this dusty road, in the middle of a noisy crowd, the Messiah, God incarnate in the flesh, hears the single cry of a poor, desperate, marginalized man, and he stops. 
You know that way that like when you're in a crowd but you think you hear someone say your name and you, you kind of stop and listen? And then Jesus does something I really love. He tells the crowd, hey, call him closer. Jesus could call him, and call him himself, right? Instead, he's like, hey, you guys who wanted to keep him away from me, how about you call him closer? So Bartimaeus does not need much encouragement. He throws off his outer cloak. He goes running towards Jesus, the one who he believes carries the promise of wholeness. And Jesus, with crowds of people around him, fixes all of his attention on Bartimaeus and asks him one question. What do you wish that I might do for you? What do you wish that I might do for you? And Bartimaeus, not yet a follower of Jesus, knows exactly what he wants Jesus to do for him. Let me see again. Help me. Immediately, his sight is returned. Jesus says, your faith has healed you. And the gospel tells us that he now follows Jesus on the road, inside the crowd, not on the outside anymore. What do you wish that I might do for you. I meet with a group of fellow students every week for a class. It's a really rich, uh, meaningful time. And a couple of weeks ago, we reflected on this passage together. And we invited each other to share um, how we would respond to this question if Jesus asked it of us today in this moment. And I think you might be a little surprised by some of the answers. I think you would expect something a little uh, more spiritual or scholarly from a group of seminarians, but guess what? We're just ordinary people. And uh, I realized that the reality was that in that moment, in that week, um, if Jesus came to me and said, what is it that you wish I might do for you? I would just say, I need help being enough for all of the responsibilities that I have. I need help being enough, there being enough of me to meet my kids' needs, not just their basic needs, but to be a nurturing and good mother. I need enough of me that after the long work day, I can come home and still get dinner and laundry and dishes, which of course, the dishwasher was broken, and literally last Sunday, I opened the refrigerator door and it fell off and hit me. So things were going super well. And there was, there, I, just, I just want help, God, with there to be enough of me to get all the things done. I don't need a new spiritual perspective about it. I need some tangible help getting stuff done. I wasn't asking for a double portion of the Holy Spirit or for divine wisdom, which would all be really good things to ask for. And I strongly encourage you to seek these spiritual things. But the truth of the matter was, I wanted some help. And I told my classmates, you know, if Jesus would come and help me with the laundry, I'd really appreciate it. And I was embarrassed to admit that it was the truth. It was the truth about how I felt, my human burdens, the everyday loads of life. You know what that's like, to be stretched so thin, to have pressures on you, to have lists of things that need to get done, not enough hours in the day, not enough of you to go around. And my classmates' responses, they actually weren't all that different. I mean, none of them were asking the Savior to do their laundry, so they're reasonably holier than I am. But their requests were very practical, very human. And my friend Shauna in the group uh, has simply been unable to let go of the fact that I had said I would like Jesus to help me with the laundry. And I'm thankful for her persistence in bringing me back to that, as humbling as that has been because it's caused me to really think about this interaction between Bartimaeus and Jesus and to imagine a similar interaction between Jesus and me. Because at the heart of that question is a lot deeper question. And that question is, does Jesus care about the everyday dilemmas and burdens of the human experience? Does Jesus actually care that you're stressed about a test, that you went through a breakup, that you feel overwhelmed, that you miss home? Does Jesus care that you're not getting along with your professor? 
Does Jesus care about the everyday experience of being human? That's at the heart of the question. And does Jesus want to do anything about it? And I've come to a conclusion. Well, I mean, you know, I don't really come to conclusions. I have an idea. <laughs> I'm on this journey just like you. And I think there's something that Bartimaeus understands about Jesus that we need to understand too. Something that will help us in our relationship with Jesus and our relationship with each other. And so to help us see what that is, we're going to have to look at a couple other passages uh, just quickly and briefly for the sake of time today. So I have to kind of move fast with me. But first off, I really do have to give uh, like credit props to my professor, Dr. Scott Cromode, and his book, uh, The Innovative Church, because they've really served to lead me in this journey. And some of these connections are connections he made for me and I have elaborated on or just learned from. Uh, so, uh, hey, Scott. You'll never see this because there's not a chance on this earth I would send him the link. But just so he knows, I gave him due credit, okay? So I'm jumping back to uh, Mark 8. And I'm going to paraphrase. It begins in verse 27. What kind of happens here? Jesus was traveling with the disciples, and he strikes up a conversation with them. He says, hey, who do people, like, say that I am? Like, what do people say about me? Uh, like, how do they understand me? And they're like, oh, you know, uh, some say you're John the Baptist, and some say you're Elijah, and some say, you know, you're one of the prophets. And, and that made sense because that was the framework with which they could understand all that Jesus was doing. And then Jesus is like, okay, okay, that's cool. Uh, but, but who do you say that I am? And Peter's this, like, super A-plus student, so he's like, you're the Messiah, and that's the right answer. Uh, but Jesus is like, hey, don't tell anybody that. And then he goes on to tell them that the Messiah himself is going to go on and suffer horrifically at the hands of people and be killed. So it's this very uh, startling contrast in this moment. And it's Jesus trying to tell them, you have the right answer, I am the Messiah. But you have the incorrect understanding of what that means. Well, they don't actually learn from that because we move on to Mark 9. And here we have the disciples walking along again in verse 33. And they're arguing about who is the greatest among them, right? That sounds like a group of 12 men. And they're like, yeah, I'm the best. Uh, I'm the greatest. Like, look at all I've done, right? And scripture says that literally Jesus like sat them down. He's like, sit down. Let's do this again. Let's have a little conversation. And he says to them, whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all which probably makes like zero sense to them. I imagine that they're like, that math ain't mathin', right? Whoever has to be first has to be last, like, mm. But because they're all still competing for who the greatest is, they're like, yes, Jesus, mm-hmm, preach, I feel you. James really needs to hear that. That's good, right? But they don't get it. We know they don't get it. They don't have any clue that Jesus is telling them something very profound about the kingdom of God that is radically different than their expectations and the world that they've experienced. Then right before Mark records this interaction between Jesus and Bartimaeus, we see it again. But this time I'm going to read it to you. So it's Mark chapter 10, verse 35. It says, And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, approached Jesus, saying to him, Teacher, we wish that you would do for us whatever we might request of you. And he said to them, what do you wish that I might do for you? And they said to him, Grant to us that in your glory we may sit on your right and one on your left. I just want to point out two things about that. One, Jesus asks them the same question he asks Bartimaeus. Mark actually records it in the same way, which he does on purpose. The second thing is, their response reveals that they still don't understand what it means that Jesus is the Messiah. They don't understand what Jesus has come to do. They don't actually understand Jesus' mission. They're still expecting a warrior king who will claim the throne and bring them along to bask in his glory, right? Because if he's the promised Messiah and he assumes the throne, guess who his inner cabinet is? Sweet! Glory for us. We're on the inside with the Messiah. Super cool. Jesus tells James and John, I don't 
you can't drink the cup I'm going to drink. I don't think you can handle it, right? And then they walk along, and the other disciples are like, why would you ask that, dude? I'm the greatest. And now we're arguing again. Jesus is like, sit down one more time. And in verse 43 through 45, he says, whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. They don't get it. Something's not adding up. When Jesus asked them what he could do for them, they asked for power and glory. When Jesus asked Bartimaeus what he could do for him, Bartimaeus wanted mercy and healing. How do you understand the Messiah? How do you understand Jesus? What does it mean for your life today, not just eternity, what does it mean for your life today and the world around you that Jesus is the Messiah? How do you think a Messiah should act and be. If Jesus took on flesh and walked among us today, who would you expect Jesus to interact with? What would you expect Jesus to be like? What do you think Jesus should do? And I mean really try to answer that, like with words and sentences. Because I've been mulling over that for a couple weeks, and I have an idea of what that answer should be, But what I'm trying to discern is what my knee-jerk gut reaction would be if I saw Jesus live out what the Messiah should do in the here and now, whether or not I'd be on board with that. If I'd be like, yeah, yeah, that that looks like Messiah behavior. Like, what do I actually understand about Jesus? What do I believe about what the Messiah should do or be? And I'm still working that out. But here's what I do know from just this brief survey of of a few places in scripture is this. The Messiah contradicted what those closest to him thought he should be like. And the Messiah is the Holy Trinity come down to our level, clothed in human flesh, fully immersed in the human condition, who heard the cry of one man and stopped to ask him, what can I do to serve you? What can I do for you? The Messiah. It sounds like something we expect people in the service industry to say, how can I help you? Hey, this is Jesus. What can I do for you? Right? We expect people in service, in service jobs to say, what can I do for you? I'm listening. All eyes on you. What can I do for you? And to think that God would take on flesh and ask that of just ordinary people. What is it you wish that I would do for you? Blows my mind. I mean, if you really imagine it, someone that people expected and saw with all authority and power and might walking around, stopping in his agenda for the day just to find out, hey, you, what can I do for you? How can I serve you? That math does not math. That does not make sense. But it is the radical way of an upside down kingdom. And it tells me something. That God actually cares about the details and dilemmas of our everyday lives. And in faith, we are invited to answer Jesus' question extended to us. After meeting with my class, I chose to be honest with Jesus and answer that question authentically. And you know what happened? My house was miraculously cleaned, and I absorbed all of my reading through osmosis as I slept. No, that's not what happened. Suddenly, people around me, without my doing it, asked me a question. What can I do to help you? And it sounded really familiar. 
And I did that really hard thing of letting them help. Right? It is so simple and yet so profound that as human beings, we can embody Christ's love for one another through acts of service that meet each other's needs just as Christ has done for us. Because you know what happened when they met my tangible needs? I better understood who Jesus is. I better understood who Jesus is. There is so much I don't understand, so many things I don't know. But I feel pretty confident about two things. One, Jesus repeatedly reminded the disciples that the kingdom he ushered in was radically different than what they expected or imagined. And even for the savior of the world, it wasn't one of self-promotion, but one of self-sacrifice in service to others, fueled by God's generous love and hospitality. And two, God's generosity to us should inspire us to embody that generosity in service to others. Because I think that somewhere in that countercultural midst of loving and providing for and genuinely caring for and serving one another, we will actually experience the kingdom of God on this earth. And I don't know where you are today with that. But my prayer is that you will believe that Jesus genuinely cares about you and wants to help you, right? Like it's so oversimplified that it seems like, like that can't be. But like the God of the universe actually cares for, and we have all of this evidence to prove that, you as an individual by name. And I pray that you go from this place confident that Jesus hears your cry for help and responds to you. That Jesus asks you, what is it that you wish that I would do for you? And actually wants to hear the answer. Jesus isn't a genie in a lamp. He may transform what it is that we want, but we start by being honest with him about what it is that we want, right? And for those of you leaving this place, my prayer is that you experience the abundant and generous love of God through the body of Christ, even if you are not a believer. I pray that you go from this place and you see people embody Christ's love for you. And if you are a believer then I urge you to participate in God's work in the world by embodying that love for others. Go in peace from this place and serve the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed.